Hi, my name is Grant Haas, and welcome to the Filipino History Podcast. So, today's topic on the podcast is on the first Filipino settlement in the United States. And during this topic, I want you to just to keep in mind, I'm not referring to when the first Filipino arrived in the U.S., but when the first permanent settlement was created and what that settlement was all about. But first, I want to ask a question. How do we discern, how do we know fact from fiction when it comes to looking at a historical story or narrative? So how can a national or popular misconception create a distraction from the truth or even create its own truth? Some of you may be scratching your head right now wondering, what's a national or popular misconception? Well, let me give you an example. In America, a story is commonly told about our first president, George Washington. It's called the Cherry Tree Story. This story, told by Mason Weems, who was one of the first biographers of Washington's life, conveys a lesson about telling the truth. So, as this cherry tree story goes, it took place during Christmas. George Washington, he was six years old at the time. So, his dad gave him a gift, and that gift was an axe, an Indian tomahawk. And at first, you know, he used the axe to do things like chop wood for his family, But one day, while he was chopping wood, he mischievously decided to use the axe on his father's cherry tree. When George's father found the damaged tree, he initially blamed it on his slave boy, Jerry. Keep in mind now that in 18th century America, it was common for white people to own slaves. So, going back to the story, George had cut down his father's cherry tree, and his father had blamed it on the slave, Jerry. George's father decided he must punish Jerry, and he was about to whip Jerry. And at the same time, George cried out, Oh, Papa, oh, Papa, don't whip poor Jerry. If someone must be whipped, let it be me, for it was I and not Jerry that cut down the cherry tree. He bravely cried out, I can't tell a lie, Pa. You know I can't tell a lie. I did cut through it with my hatchet. Run to my arms, you dearest boy, cried his father. Run to my arms. Glad am I, George, that you killed my tree, for you have paid me back for it a thousandfold. Such an act of heroism in my son is worth more than a thousand trees. This story about George Washington is ingrained in many American children from a young age, in school and at home, to discuss telling the truth in honesty. It's a tale about morality and how we need to be honest with each other. According to author Bella Coral, stories about George Washington as a boy have been retold so many times through the years that even though we're not sure they really did happen, they have become a part of the story of America. The fable has created a misconception about Washington that has been surrounded in controversy, as many scholars debate if it ever occurred. A similar misconception appears to exist about when the first Filipinos had a permanent settlement in America. Some scholars believe that the first Filipinos to create a settlement in the U.S. traveled from Mexico across the Gulf of Mexico, which is a body of water underneath the United States, and eventually landed in the area of modern-day New Orleans, Louisiana, in 1763. Once again, keep in mind I'm not referring to when the first Filipino arrived in the U.S., but when the first permanent settlement was created. The story of Filipinos in the New Orleans area during the early American Republic, which we define as 1789 to 1829, is marred by half-truths, deception, and historical romanticism. We do know that Filipinos were settled in New Orleans and its surrounding areas between the American Revolutionary War in 
and the Civil War, the exact dates of arrival and their roles in historical events has been an area of contention for many historians. For example, when thinking of historical events, one may ask the question, did Filipinos fight for or against the British in the War of 1812? While this participation is within the realm of possibility, the current evidence is just not convincing. So, why is this all important? It's because historians who have attributed incorrect settlement dates, such as 1763, have created a false narrative about when the first Filipino settlement occurred in America. Incorrect settlement dates have been widely spread across the internet. Go to your computer and, and do a simple Google search for uh, first Filipino settlement in America. And it'll show you that the first Filipino settlement was in 1763. And keep in mind, that's from Wikipedia. And we can, we're going to talk about that later. So anyways, how do historians support their versions of what happened? For example... Um, how do I, as a historian, support my version and my thesis about when the first Filipino settlement occurred? Well, we do this by analyzing primary and secondary sources. So primary sources are items such as artifacts, original documents, um, diaries, manuscripts, autobiographies, uh, we look more recently, we have like recordings, or pretty much any other source of information that was created at the time of the story, at the time of the narrative. Secondary sources, uh, on the other hand, are documents or recordings that discuss information originally presented elsewhere. So you pick up a book, you read about Filipinos, and you look at the back of the book, and you can see primary sources. That would be an example of a secondary source. You know, a primary source would be a newspaper article from the time frame being studied, and the secondary source would be a book or article written about the newspaper article. So those are, that's a, a quick summary of, of what primary and secondary sources are. So, when did Filipinos settle in Louisiana, and what controversy surrounds the supposed 1763 date when Filipinos are said to have created a permanent settlement? Well, we do know that the first permanent settlement uh, in Louisiana was called St. Malo. So, uh, let's take a look at the controversy surrounding that 1763 date and discover what type of settlement St. Malo was. Regarding the settlement date of 1763, we do have some primary and secondary sources that can give us clues into the proper date. On the one hand, we have primary sources that indicate Filipinos most likely settled in New Orleans between 1820 and 1840. And on the other hand, Many semi-authoritative sources, such as the U.S. Congress and Department of Defense, have placed the earliest settlement around 1763. The Department of Veteran Affairs, otherwise known as the VA, notes on their website that Filipinos fought alongside General Andrew Jackson's forces during the famed Battle of New Orleans near the end of the War of 1812. Unfortunately, though, none of these government sources can bag up their findings with any primary sources. And searching through Jackson's writing, it appears to be pure speculation posted on the VA's website. So some of you may think I'm being over, overly critical of, of the VA's website and, and their lack of sources, but it's the job of historians to be critical of websites like the VAs that don't provide any evidence for their claims. So once again, the, the best evidence that we have shows that Filipino men first migrated to New Orleans 
around the 1820s to 1840s. And these men appear to have formed a fishing settlement, which is this first settlement we're referring to, called St. Malo. And this was just located about 30 miles outside the actual city of New Orleans, if you look at a map today. So these men provided exports to the city. And they exported items such as dried shrimp and fish. And they did that to support, many of them had families living in New Orleans. So they did that to support their families. And keep in mind, there was a lot of ethnic and cultural diversity in New Orleans before and after the Louisiana Purchase that may have allowed Filipinos to quickly assimilate into the society of New Orleans. So to better understand the journeys that these men took, let's take a deeper look at the settlement of St. Malo itself. So the journeys of these Filipino men in New Orleans remained a mystery all the way until 1883, when an article by Lafcadio Hearn appeared in Harper's Weekly. Hearn described the strange community of Malay fishermen known as Tagalas from the Philippine Islands. And in case you're wondering, Tagala is defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary as a subgroup of Austronian languages of the Philippines. Yet, Hearn here appears to be comparing these men to the Tagala Indians who were used by the Spaniards in Manila as domestic servants. So, the community of St. Malo was very isolated, and it was not a known destination to even the United States Postal Service. There was no law enforcement or tax collectors in St. Malo. Hearn referred to this community as a Manila Settlement, and it was... Um, the community itself and the area and the land was a saltwater swamp and it created a hostile environment for the cultivation of crops. So there, there was no farming in the community of St. Malo. And women and children did not typically inhabit the settlement due to alligators, mosquitoes, poisonous snakes. There uh, appear to be a lot of good reasons why uh, the Filipino men did not want their wives and children living at St. Malo. So, Hearn's accounting of St. Malo became one of the first in-depth accounts of Filipinos um, at St. Malo and in the state of Louisiana, the, the New Orleans area. Hearn, in his writing, described the inhabitants of St. Malo as, quote, cinnamon-colored men, a few are glossily yellow, like that bronze which a small proportion of gold is worked by the molder. Their features are irregular without actually being repulsive. Some have the cheekbones very prominent, and the eyes of several, several are set slightly aslant. End quote. They are assumed to be from the Philippines because in quote, Manila there are several varieties of the Malay race. And these Louisiana settlers represent more than one type, end quote. So the men of St. Malo spoke both a Spanish and a Malay dialect, which is most likely Tagalog. Money was also reportedly being sent back to Manila to aid in the immigration of family members to the New Orleans area. So Hearn highlights that immigrants usually ship as seamen on board some Spanish vessel for American ports. So immigrants are coming on vessels to American ports, and he wrote that they desert at the first opportunity. So they are getting off these Spanish ships. And keep in mind, this is giving them information that they're very familiar with Spanish culture. And this understanding of Spanish culture and language undoubtedly undoubtedly allowed these men to mingle with nearby dwellers uh, in Proctorville, Louisiana. It's a, it's a Spanish town nearby, 
And also in in New Orleans, they were able to relate to Spanish people uh, living in New Orleans. And just to give you some context, Proctorville and St. Malo, uh, again, are located about 30 miles southeast from uh, modern-day New Orleans. So Hearn dated the community of St. Malo as about 50 years old possibly formed in the 1840s. So this is going uh, against the notion that it was founded back in 1763. In addition, a reporter from the Times Democrat of New Orleans also traveled with Hearn to St. Malo. And this reporter gave a different accounting, a less romanticized accounting of some of the same events at St. Malo. The Times Democrat a newspaper reporter mentions uh, a white man who had been living among the Filipinos at the time, saying that St. Malo, she had been here 40 years ago. All Malay men, deserters, come here and make the place. These two dates from Hearn and the Times Democrat reporter place the founding of St. Malo just a few decades before the Civil War. None of the Filipino men were quoted as having fought in any deadly conflicts earlier before the Civil War. Some historians have argued for an earlier settlement date. Scholar Marina Espina, in her 1988 book, Filipinos in Louisiana, placed the earliest settlement around 1763 in the bayous of the Mississippi River outside the city of New Orleans. She argues that, quote, the first Filipinos to come to Louisiana were sailors who served in the Manila Acapulco galleon trade, a very lucrative commercial venture between Mexico and the Philippines, end quote. So Espina believes that between 1565 and 1815, hundreds of Filipino seamen deserted their ships in Acapulco, Mexico then traveling and eventually making their way by boat to Louisiana from Mexico. Unfortunately, Espina lacks primary sources for her claim that the earliest settlement was in 1763. So Espina, uh, a resident of New Orleans, claims that much of the work she had done about the first Filipino settlers of Louisiana was destroyed when her home flooded after Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. After the destruction of her records, she said, quote, The story of the Manila men and their descendants has almost become my entire life, end quote. So what scholars disagree with Espina's assertion that the earliest settlement was in 1763? Well, one scholar, Malcolm Churchill, in his article, Louisiana History and Early Filipino Settlement, disagrees completely. He points out that, quote, Marina Espina bases her assertion that Filipinos came to Louisiana in 1765 solely on the fact that Filipinos were known to be in Mexico prior to 1765 that Spanish ships sailed from Veracruz through the Gulf of Mexico to Spain, and that it therefore seems reasonable to her that Filipinos would have arrived in Louisiana by 1765. As to why she chose 1765 rather than some other date, her explanation is that she, quote, just kind of picked it up, end quote. Churchill highlights that in reviewing Espina's reasoning, one must pose two counter-questions. So, the first question that Churchill poses is, why on earth would galleon sailors who jumped ship in Acapulco after 1764 not join the existing Filipino communities in Mexico? As the, the Filipino sailors had been doing, for nearly 200 years. In other words, what would draw Filipinos to settle in Louisiana? 
The second point he makes is, what would attract Filipino sailors after 1764 to a distant land where no one spoke their language and Spanish was going to be of little use among a largely French-speaking population? Because Louisiana was under French control from 1682 to 1762, and New Orleans was founded during the French rule. So, although Espina's ideas about the first Filipinos in Louisiana is possible, it doesn't appear very probable. And I just wanted to take a second here to clarify the dates. Um, Churchill uses the date of 1765, and other scholars have used the date of 1763. So if you do notice the dates jumping back and forth, that's because different scholars um, have used different dates when referring to Espina's work. So moving on, uh, Churchill goes on to claim that a man named Larry Bartlett had fabricated the 1763 date. Bartlett was a colleague of Espina in 1977. He worked at the University of New Orleans in the public relations department where Espina was employed. He was a writer for the New Orleans Times. So Bartlett wrote an article entitled The Filipino Cajuns. He interviewed Espina about her research on Filipinos in the article. So then what Bartlett did is he fabricated the opening of the article with this extensive, fanciful account. He even provided names for non-existent ships and supposed captains. So uh, Bartlett kind of makes the story up. And in 1998, a decade after Espina's book was published, Churchill actually confronted her about the 1763 date. Espina was, quote, puzzled and upset about Bartlett having created his fictional account, end quote. Although Espina may not have fabricated the information herself, she and other historians are guilty of preserving this faulty narrative into the 21st century. Espina's book is commonly cited in books, documentaries, and websites, such as Wikipedia, and and by scholars who want to hold on to the somewhat romantic misconception of the 1763 settlement date. So once again, let me emphasize that a simple Google search for the first Filipino settlement in America will come up, you know, at the top of the list, you'll see the first permanent settlement was in 1763. And while sites like Wikipedia are useful for finding sources on the subject, they can be dangerous in that they are edited by pretty much anyone. So Churchill argues that St. Malo is sometimes confused with an earlier settlement date due to historians wishfully seeking a connection. He argues that while Hearn himself did not suggest a connection with the Spanish galleons, his words deserters and desperate refugees from Spanish justice could be misconstrued. Some historians are trying to make Hearn's writing fit into their own narrative. So now that we've discussed the settlement dates and the controversy surrounding it, let's take a look at who were the inhabitants of St. Malo and how did they survive through the 1800s? So the romanticized and nostalgic version of St. Malo, as we've been previously mentioning, neglects the inhabitants that were there primarily for financial gain. They were trying to, to provide for themselves and provide for their families, some of them, some of whom were living in New Orleans. Churchill writes that the inhabitants of St. Malo were not there as fugitives seeking out an isolated location, but as trappers and fishermen out to make money through the shipment of smoked fish and alligator skins to commercial markets. <laughs> 
So what Churchill is saying here is that the Filipino men weren't there as deserters. They weren't there to escape Spanish rule. They were there for financial gain. They were there to work. St. Malo was a place of work. They were trying to provide for themselves and their families who were living in New Orleans. So Hearn highlighted this aspect of St. Malo life through an interview with Thomas de los Santos, one of the Manila men. He wrote that Santos married a white woman by whom he had two children, a boy named Valentine and a daughter, Winnie, who had died. Santos' son, Valentine, was educated in New Orleans and then moved to St. Malo in order to work with his father. St. Malo was less of a settlement, like we've been saying, and more of a means to earn income. So before St. Malo was destroyed by a hurricane in 1915, Thomas and Valentine de los Santos had already been recorded as residing in New Orleans for a few years. This record would further support the idea that St. Malo was a way for Filipino men to provide for their families who lived in New Orleans. St. Malo only lacked two attributes of permanent, self-contained community. The first was women and children, and the second was agriculture. So, St. Malo was not settled as a community to raise a family. Filipinos assimilated into communities such as New Orleans to raise those families. In 1866, an article entitled Our Present Asianic Population, published in the New Orleans Daily Crescent, provided some context to the Filipino population in New Orleans after the Civil War. The article stated that the, quote, Malay population, which comes almost entirely from the Philippine Islands, of which Manila is the principal city, end quote, has a population that is estimated to be, quote, as high as 2,000, end quote, within the state of Louisiana. The article goes on to describe the Manilians as industrious, a hard-working portion of our population who have a darker complexion than the Chinese and are never seen more than five and a half feet high. Prior to the Civil War, an article by Thibodeau Minerva referred to Filipinos in a less flattering manner. In the article, The Races of Men, Malays are characterized as exhibiting, quote, considerable intellectual capacity, but their moral character is very low, end quote. The negative characterization of Filipino morals may be due to newspaper articles that portrayed the Manila men as pirates who would often not only take over ships, but murder the captain and crew. Filipinos would often be in conflict with the two countries fighting to enslave most of Asia, Great Britain and Spain. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, why do I keep bringing up different terms for Filipinos? It's because the word Filipino wasn't in the vocabulary of 19th century Americans. Thus, words such as Manila men, Malays, and Manilian were used. When researching histories, one must take into consideration how our vocabulary has actually changed over time. Getting back to St. Malo. Conflicts between the Manila men of St. Malo and the residents of nearby Spanish-dominated Proctorville would arise. Filipino men were most likely familiar with the Spaniards as the Spanish-controlled Manila was considered commercially both extensive and lucrative. Manila was considered the seat of the Spanish government in the east. The Spanish men of Proctorville held a monopoly on the fishing industry during the late 1850s and early 1860s. This dominance would lead to many conflicts as the Filipino men of St. Malo were their main competition. So the first such documented conflict appears in 1858. The Daily Delta reported the stabbing of John Davis, a fisherman by a Manila man 
named Seriano. Another conflict between the two communities occurred in July of 1860. On Friday, July 13, 1860, the Cincinnati Daily Press reported a bloody fight breaking out between a Manila man, a Spanish barkeeper named Ramon, and multiple Spanish fishermen. It appeared that the Manila man struck the barkeeper during a dispute, which caused the fishermen to attack. The Filipino drew a long knife and buried it into the first fisherman, killing him. He then wounded two others who later died at the hospital. As the Manila man fled, he would wound two more fishermen before he was shot dead by his pursuers. The Daily Delta, another paper, dubbed it the War of the Fishermen. On Wednesday, July 18, 1860, the Daily Delta reported that the controversy between the Spanish fishermen and those who are called Manila men grows out of a rivalry of trade. Sabotage between the Spaniards and Manila men became common as fishing ships were burnt and nets were destroyed. The Daily Delta, in reporting on this conflict, took the side of the Manila men, condemning the Spanish as a disgrace to Christianity and civilization. It was reported that not only did the Spanish murder the Filipino, but they desecrated his body, allowing it to float to shore like a dead fish or animal. These attacks appear to be the result of economic frustration with the Spanish fishermen. So to summarize, St. Malo was a community of primarily Filipino men who are focused on producing goods to support themselves and their families. So... A question you may have is, how were Filipinos, with their many shades of skin color, able to assimilate into a slave-holding territory such as New Orleans? Well, one of the driving forces for Filipinos to settle in New Orleans may have been the mixture of French, Spanish, and American cultures. Ebard Faber, in his book, Building the Land of Dreams describes the Orleans Territory as a kaleidoscope of interrelations of multiple races and national groups. Filipinos in the Orleans Territory did not appear to have the same racial discrimination as blacks. One possible reason for the acceptance of Filipinos is that they arrived as free men and women from a Spanish government that recently ruled Louisiana for decades. The tense racial divide between white and black may have also aided in Filipinos avoiding discrimination. Filipinos appear to be more of an economic threat than a racial one to the other ethnic groups in New Orleans. The settlement of St. Malo is portrayed as an economic facet of the lives of many Filipino men, since many of them had wives and families in the region that were dependent on them. Very little, if any, descriptions of Filipino discrimination can be found during the early American Republic. And this is most likely because Filipinos would often create their own work communities like St. Malo. So when it comes to the settlement of St. Malo, let's just face it. The historical narrative of when Filipinos came to Louisiana is complicated. Filipinos may have arrived in Louisiana in 1763, but it is highly unlikely. The date has become a popular fable or myth among some who wish to romanticize Filipinos coming to America. Like the fable of George Washington, the fable of the first Filipino settlement in 1763 lives on despite a lack of evidence. Just as George Washington's story was most likely fabricated or invented, so too was the settlement date of St. Malo in 1763. In doing my research for this podcast, I've spoken with Filipinos who will admit there are no primary sources to base their beliefs. Even with this knowledge, they still hope that evidence will surface in the future. While there's nothing wrong with hoping for evidence, we must base our assertions of the past in facts. The primary sources available in 2019 established the founding of St. Malo between the 1820s to the 1840s. The current evidence points out that the settlement of St. Malo consisted of men, young and old, 
who are yearning to provide for themselves and for their families. Hopefully in the future, more evidence will surface to give historians more context about St. Malo. I hope you have enjoyed this podcast. If you'd like more information about St. Malo, as well as the sources used to create this podcast, please visit my website at www.filipinohistory.us. There you can also view other podcasts and interact with us on Facebook and YouTube. Until next time, this is the Filipino History Podcast. I'm Grant Haas.